Microfocus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Herb Lechner sitting in for Gary Kildall this week. Herb, what I have up on the computer here is, it's a game, I guess, but it's really a teaching tool that teaches the, the student working with this algebraic expressions and the graphic representations of these algebraic expressions. What just happened is these little guys here are called algebroids, and the test for me is to write an equation down here using all these available trigonometric and algebraic functions to try to plot a graph which will intersect as many of these algebroids as possible. Now let's just, uh, just for the heck of it, try something uh, very simple here. and We'll just say y equals x and see if we can hit a couple of these guys with the graph that gets drawn. And you can see the graph coming. I may have got one guy by the leg like and one guy two. by the ear. And after it draws the graph, it'll then show me whether I've hit these guys or not. Come on. Got him. Down. <laughs> and the object here, obviously, is to learn uh, equations, uh, these, these expressions, learn their graphic representation. And we'll just go one more round. Just to show you how it really does motivate uh, someone, there's a character in here called the uh, graph gobbler. And you're not allowed to have your graph run through him. So I'll see if we can uh, uh, draw something simpler. You think y minus x will make it? Looks uh, like a nice. Herb, let's try that. And just demonstrate. There you go. And he eats your graph up. <laughs> and he punishes you by sending you to the committee, which then penalizes you. Anyhow, we're talking about computers in education uh, today, Herb. And the uh, first question that comes to mind as we talk about the use of computers in education is some people, shut up, algebra. <laughs> Some people are, are afraid, I think, of this technology, and there's a fear that computers uh, are going to replace teachers, they're, they're going to perhaps dehumanize education. I, is that what you see in the future? Uh, I think the expectations for uh, the use of computers in school were very high, and along with those expectations, uh, there was concern about the dehumanizing uh, effect. I, I don't think that we've used the, uh, we've seen the use of computers nearly as extensively as we expected, and therefore I don't think the impacts pro or con uh, have been terribly significant. But I do look forward to talking to our guests about that. Okay, before we meet our studio guests and see some demonstrations of other educational software, let's go visit some schools where computers are being used. Okay. With over one half of American schools equipped with computers, Students from elementary grades through college are likely to have some computer instruction at almost every level of their education. But there are still doubts over the best way to integrate computers into a traditional curriculum. Replacing the teacher with a terminal changes the focus of learning away from the instructor and to the computer. While traditional contact between teacher and student is diminished, the terminal becomes a kind of private tutor, adjusting to the different learning rates and abilities of each student. It is also interactive, demanding answers within a specific length of time, making corrections, and helping the student to understand the reasons behind a mistake. Programming languages for children rely on colorful graphics and game-like approaches, especially to teach analytical skills and problem-solving logic. For younger children, time spent at the terminal can seem more like a game than a lesson. Go. Go. Let me do it. Okay. Y e Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You forgot the <laughs> eyes. We have 29 points. Oh, great. Much of computer instruction today okay. is for rote learning okay. and practice drills. But there is another level of application that demands much more creative interaction. Programming languages like Logo are designed to teach children to make up their own programs, create their own commands, and in general put students in the active role of controlling the machine instead of just responding to an electronic inquisitor. Proponents of this approach claim that students trained to think logically will become better at problem solving in general. But at least one study questions whether there is any difference between a logo trained and a traditionally trained child.
Joining us now is Professor Patrick Soupies of Stanford University and Nancy Palmer, who's coordinator of computer education at the Palo Alto School District here in uh, the Silicon Valley. Herb? In the opening, I mentioned that it didn't seem to me that the application of computers in education was moving along as rapidly as we had hoped. How do you all feel about that? Well, I have agree with that for most of the period, which is now about 20 years, that I've been involved in the application of computers in education. Certainly for the first 15 years, I kept thinking, it ought to go faster. There ought to be more to do. There's a lot to be done here. Why aren't we getting more done? In the last three or four years, the pace has really changed. A lot of people have interested. There's a lot of hardware and an increasing amount of software in the schools. I think Nancy would agree with that. Yes, I certainly would. That's the case in our district anyway. The, the teachers, there's a lot more interest from teachers now. And they're starting to use computers within their classroom in a lot of different ways. Students in Palo Alto are now starting to use word processing and some other types of programs, data management kinds of programs to help them so that the computer is becoming more of a tool for them. Still, still learning to use uh, computer programming languages like BASIC and LOGO and Pascal. But there's a wider application now of computers. Of course, it's also important to emphasize that we've only really begun. You know, your question is right in the sense where we are now will be very different from where we are 20 years from now. What's, uh, what's triggered the movement in these past few years? What, uh, what's different now than, than what we had 10 years ago? I would say primarily the enormous reduction in the cost of hardware. And the change in the technology itself. You know, just in the last eight years, is the, when we first had computers, as far as microcomputers, for the last eight years, mm -hmm. and that's made computers a lot uh, more reasonable for schools to buy and also easier to use. So as the technology improves, as far as the ease of using it, you're going I to mean, see a lot know, more. You know that favorite joke that, uh, about computers in schools, if uh, computers followed that, if Rolls Royces followed the same trail as computers, a Rolls Royce would now cost two dollars and a half and be an uh, inch and a half long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that enormous reduction yeah. is, uh, in, uh, in cost has really revolutionized. Mm -hmm. Of course, not only schools but other places, but we see it in schools. Pat, you're using computers at Stanford now to teach your course in logic. How do you actually use the computers to teach that course? I don't give any lectures. The students don't go to lectures in this course. Uh, they come to computer terminals. There is no textbook separate from what they learn at the computer terminal. And from the student standpoint, what's very good is they come and go on their own. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, we're open for business. I have a TA, for example, a teaching assistant on duty Saturday nights, 8 to 11 p.m. And that coming and going is very important uh, advantage from the student standpoint. How about from the, an instructional point of view, though? Is it, is it better education? Is it, do you pay a price for that convenience? Well, I, I think you don't really pay a price. I think that there are, there are gives and takes in any particular way of approaching instruction. I think in addition to the freedom to come and go, I would mention the individualization. Some students just learn that kind of topic, that kind of subject matter, very much uh, more easily and quicker than other students. And that individualization is taken account of because the pace of one student doesn't affect the pace of another student, as opposed to a, a classroom setting. Secondly, the students get excellent opportunities to practice and be corrected in their practice of doing logical derivations and giving proofs, giving logical counterexamples. And that practice, that dealing with material in that elegant way you can do, uh, do it on a, at a computer terminal with a good, sophisticated program to back it up, in terms of checking any kind of proofs the students give. That's a great advantage. Okay, Pat, on the terminal we have here, you're hooked up uh, by modem to the computer at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And give us a demonstration of what a student would do to, to take a class uh, in your logic course. Right, this is uh, towards the very beginning of the course. The course is a large course. The students spend on average about 75 hours to complete the course at uh, a terminal like this. And uh, we're just at the beginning of learning uh, the classical rule in Latin, modus ponendo ponens. We call it in English, affirming the antecedent. You're given an argument, if A, then B. Secondly, given A, infer B. And they're going to practice, learn the, learn the strategies and, uh, and uh, begin to uh, practice derivations, logical derivations, using this rule. 
Okay, so the first thing is kind of the text material that teaches the principle? For ex principle and the strategy of how to attack a proof. For example, here it's saying, well, we'll use a simple working backward strategy. Look for what we're going to derive. What is the conclusion we want to infer? And then the next step is look for a conditional statement uh, and some premises that we can begin to work with. Okay, can the student go ahead then and actually try to practice what he's just learned? Yes, and, and, and that practice is, of course, the critical thing. Just putting out the uh, exposition wouldn't be very interesting. What is interesting and powerful in the course is the great flexibility of responses uh, the student can give in terms of constructing uh, proofs that interest him. So we'll, we'll consider a very simple example of this. There isn't time to do something uh, complicated. Here, we want to derive uh, the premise W. We use letters here for, to make the argument simple. And the premises are using the arrow for if then. The first premise is if S then Q. The second premise is if Q then W. And the third is S. Now, we can combine one and three, affirming the antecedent of the, of the conditional in one to get the conclusion Q. So we type in one, comma three and AA for the affirm the antecedent rule. See, the language is mainly a control language the students give. We don't like the students to have to type a lot. Now we have Q and we look at two, if Q then W, combining two and four. Uh, suppose I made a mistake. Uh, let's see what happens. So I combine one and four. But of course, four is not the antecedent of one. And the program types back, you need a conditional and its antecedent. I haven't, don't have the antecedent. So now let's do it right. Two, four, lines two and four, from the antecedent, and we'll get immediately the desired conclusion, W. Mm -hmm. Nancy, at the, at the high school level, how are computers being used there? Just to teach computers themselves or, or, or used in this way to teach other courses? They're used in both ways. They're used as, you know, for programming itself. And they're also used uh, for word processing for uh, in business classes and accounting. We have foreign language. We have uh, programs on the computer that students can practice foreign languages and, and, and learn, actually learn a foreign language using by computer. And uh, there's uh, some programs that are being used in the science department now. And we have a social, couple of social studies teachers that are using simulations. I guess the real key is what difference has it made? What's the bottom line? Are the achievement scores going up? for those uh, classes using computers? Well, that's, that's kind of a hard one to answer. As far as uh, any real strong data on achievement scores by using computers, I don't think we're at that stage that we've come up with anything like that. We feel that we, there has been a difference in students in, uh, you know, with their interest in school, for instance, a lot of different things that have uh, kept motivated, uh, but as far as any real data, no, we don't have any. No okay, we're, no. we're going to we're going to stop for a moment and come back uh, soon and take a look at Logo, a, a teaching language, which is an interesting language to look at. We'll have a demonstration of that. Also, we're going to meet the author of a book called Brave New Schools about the use of computers in the schools in the future. That's coming up in just a moment. With us now is Glenn Kleiman, founder of the Teaching Tools Microcomputer Service and author of the book, as we mentioned, Brave New Schools. Glenn, uh, we want to talk to you about Logo in particular. Uh, and we hear an awful lot more than we have about Logo now as a teaching language, as something mm -hmm. to be used for, for students. What is the significance of Logo as a language? Well, Logo is a, a newer programming language than, say, BASIC. Um, it's one that's been widely touted as the language to use to t introduce kids to computers. There have been a lot of claims about Logo that it's an ideal way to teach problem solving skills, that it would revolutionize education. Um, I don't really believe a lot of those claims, but I think it has a number of nice advantages for introducing kids to computers, introducing kids to programming, and also that it does have some implications for more general problem solving types of skills. Could we do a little demonstration here? Maybe people would understand more what we're talking about, and then we can follow up. Okay. You have Logo loaded, and I have, show us what it is. I have Logo up and loaded. There are a couple of components to Logo, and maybe I should fill in a minute or so of background before going to the demo. Sure. Uh, there are two main components. One that's very well known is called Turtle Graphics, which has to do with displaying things on the computer screen. That's what I'll be showing, and that's what's widely used with kids. There's a whole second component called List Processing Commands, 
which enables you to use this programming language to work with words, sentences, numbers, and other types of things. But it's the turtle graphics commands that have really been widely used in education. What we have in turtle graphics are some very simple commands that kids can learn easily. You can tell the turtle to do things like move forward a certain number of turtle steps, turn right or left a certain number of degrees. The turtle has a pen. It can lift the pen up or down. If the pen is down, it can draw things as it goes. Okay? The idea of logo is that these simple commands can be combined into what we call procedures, and very complex programs can gradually be built up among a number of procedures. What I have already loaded in the computer is one example procedure, which is a simple one, but one that can do a number of interesting things. The procedure has been given the name magic, and magic requires that we tell the turtle we want to use magic, and we give it four numbers so that it knows what to do. And as a sample, we can start out with the numbers 20, 90, 10, and 8. If we do that, the turtle will draw us a little picture. What the numbers are telling the turtle to do, the first number is the length of the first line. The second number, 90 here, is the angle for the turtle to change, to turn. So we'll see we have right angles here. We can also see that the length of each line the turtle has drawn increases as we go on. The third number is the increment. Okay, so the first line was 20, we increase it by 10, the next one's 30, the next one's 40. The final number, 8 here, is the number of turns for the turtle to make before stopping. Okay, so it's a simple procedure built up of forward and right and repetition. Okay, the interesting thing about this particular procedure is we can get very different kinds of pictures just by changing the numbers. So here I'm changing the starting line, the increment, and the number of turns, but I'm leaving the angle at 90 degrees. Okay, we get a little more intricate, interesting picture. Now what happens if we just change that angle? So let's use the same starting number, increase the angle to 135, same increment, same number of turns. Okay. Now we have a star-shaped picture, a very different type of image, just from changing the angle. So one kind of thing that Logo is designed for is to lead kids to explore the computer, explore what will happen with these kinds of forms, and the children can just get a feel for what angles are, how you can build up different pictures by typing in different numbers and seeing what will happen. Okay. There are some more I can show if we go, have a well, few more Well, go ahead. Yes, you show us another. another okay, news. let's just make another change in You're the still angle. Still doing magic, though. Here. Still doing magic, if I typed it correctly. So changing the angle and changing the number of uh, turns that the turtle makes. Yeah. Here we have a much steeper angle and another very different picture. Um, now let me show you what the procedure itself is. We can have the computer list the procedure. Uh, this is the entire program that we're working with. The first line simply says to the turtle, we're going to tell you how to do the magic procedure. We're going to teach you a new word in a sense. The magic procedure uses these four numbers, which we're calling start, angle, increment, and end for number of turns. The first thing the turtle does is go forward the number of steps it's told to by start, turns right the angle. We then say, if n equals 0, stop. What we're doing here is we're setting n to a number. The turtle will count down till n reaches 0, and it will stop there. The last line of the program is really the powerful line. It says, do magic again but do it with the line changed by the increment and with n being one less. Okay? That's what's called a recursive command. The magic procedure is repeating itself, changing as it goes along. That's the entire program that created that variety of pictures. Okay, Glenn, it, it, it's kind of interesting and it's fun to see all those pictures, but uh, it, is, it seems a bit whimsical in a way. I mean, is that, what's the big deal? It is perhaps whimsical in a way. Kids enjoy whimsy. Um, I think the big deal is that it's a very different approach than the kinds of things Professor Supies was showing. Professor Supies was showing computers really used to do the kinds of things we've always done in education, to do tutorials, to do drills, and certainly that's a valid use of computers. Logo is widely cited as an example of doing something new with computers, introducing an environment, a tool that kids can explore, where the child has more control than the computer. Here it's not that problems and questions are coming out of the computer, the computer's waiting for the child to respond. Here, the child has complete control of the situation. Pat, what's your observation on, on this use of a computer as opposed to what you're doing? Oh, I think that uh, the use of logo can be uh, valuable and fascinating for uh, 
for young students. I, I think that in, in teaching uh, students about computers, the nice thing about Logo is they get a quick and easy sense of uh, how a computer language works. That doesn't mean, for example, that uh, I think that's the only use, obviously. But I, I think it's quite a, an acceptable and valid use. Are there social or, or perhaps anti-social consequences to, to coupling kids with machines rather than kids with traditional flesh and blood teachers? Um, well, I, I, I think we want to uh, differentiate cases. In the elementary school, it's very important to have a relationship to a teacher. One of the paradoxes of American education is that the data are overwhelming, that's the way it should be, and yet class size on average is larger in elementary schools than in secondary schools. As we get to older and older students, let's say out to adults, then we're in a different kind of world. Many adults, for example, in the future may want to uh, get a good deal of their education at home over a terminal so because you, it's inconvenient see, to go to a, a campus site. You do see, as you mentioned in your own course, the possibility that an entire course or maybe curriculum would be taken by a mature student via computer. Sure. Uh, and my own courses at Stanford are meant to be uh, an example of that. And that could well be a course in programming. I mean, as far as, uh, it's very similar to teaching logic that way. But the socially important thing is you can teach courses that way. So you can have a decentralization and it's really a social decision and an administrative and psychological decision, not a technical decision. Okay, uh, real quickly, Glenn. I think I have a somewhat different view. I view the computer as a tool for the teacher to use. I certainly don't think computers are capable of replacing teachers. I, in fact, was a student in Dr. Supi's course the first year it was taught by a computer, and I found that the computer is a good means for practicing logic, but I think there's an elegance to logic. There's intuitions about logic. There's information about how formal logic relates to general problem solving that one could get from a professor like Dr. Supi's better than any computer program. Gentlemen, I'm afraid on that note we'll have to leave it because we're out of time right now. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you again next week on the Computer Chronicles. Focus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution.